I'm honored to be here, man. I'm honored to be here. Of all the people who would interview me, like I'm glad it's you. I've had it as a personal tenant of mine. If we better understand the fundamental nature of reality, that we will better know how we should act in the world. But then David Hume, you're familiar with, I'm sure, his is ought problem. You cannot drive yeah. an ought from an is. Where do you stand on that? Do you have an opinion? It's not clear to me that, look, if when Newton came out with mechanics, that, that was a net positive for the world because it made, it, or made us view ourselves as automatons. So it's not clear to me that you just describe more and more fundamental reality with physics, say, or something else, and then you get to a more positive ought. I don't know. I don't know why we don't just start with the ought. Like, forget about this. something mm. else. Is, is the whole point of toe to then discard toe? There's a mm. saying that you you return home and you know the place for the first time. That's at the end of all the journeying. Is it that you don't answer the questions, but you get comfortable with leaving them unanswered? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that, that one, Carlos. Kurt J. Mungo is the host of Theories of Everything, a podcast which explores theoretical physics, consciousness, AI, and God in a technically rigorous manner. He has over 280,000 subscribers, and according to YouTube Analytics, his channel is the most popular amongst my viewers, like you. Please like and subscribe, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Kurt, thanks for coming on. Hey, man, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yes, this is, uh, oh man, long in the making and uh, so excited to have you on. I'm sure my audience will be a huge, like very excited to see you. Uh, I was looking at the uh, YouTube analytics. I mean, ever since I've had them in the last couple of years, your channel is consistently the top one that my audience overlaps with. Oh, interesting. S not Lex. Yeah, so not Lex. Lex comes in and out uh, occasionally. Uh, he's up there sometimes, but... Your channel is number one every every time I check. It's always Kurchemo, always, always. So I mean, I think this will be uh, long awaited for uh, for folks in my yeah, audience. Well, and, that's an honor. That's yeah. an honor. Yeah, yeah. Well, you make you you have a great podcast, and um, for any folks that don't aren't familiar with your work, I'll uh, I'll link below in the description with some of my favorite episodes of yours, and uh, and of course they can people can peruse your channel. You've got over two hundred eighty thousand subscribers, which is is incredible. Uh, so congratulations to you. I mean, you've just been so, so successful and, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. It doesn't feel like that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> oh yeah. It never does. Yeah. You always have the, the goalposts are always moving forward. So, um, so today we'll focus on a few different topics. Uh, one building your theory of everything. I think that'd be uh, lovely for people to hear. You've spoken with so many brilliant minds in the past few years. So I'd love to, uh, hear how these ideas are coming together in your brain. Secondly, about the podcast a little bit, and then ending up, we'll talk about you personally, uh, if we have time for it at the end. So not to, uh, to start off on the big question here, but if you had to right now, and this is a freely speculative zone, I want to say that uh, you're not committed to anything in particular at this moment. I know uh, some folks, you know, they don't want to be taken out of turn, but if you had to construct your own theory of everything at this time, what would it be? This treacherous question, man. Tough question. Right off the I bat. <laughs> okay, so I, if I was to construct my own, it may be. So look, there are two routes that most people take. They take, well, what's the similarities between every toe? That's like mm -hmm. the Baha'i faith, trying to find mm -hmm. truth in each mm -hmm. of them. And then there's people like Carlo Rovelli who say, well, I want to find the differences between different theories of or interpretations of quantum mechanics or whatever it may be. Mm. I I think it's easy to do either one of them, but not easy to do both. So what I'm trying to do is to do both. What are the similarities? What are the differences? And maybe there's a meta toe. A question that I think about so there are a few questions that I think about on a well hour to hour basis. One of them is why is it that we have so many extremely extremely prehensile and intelligent people disagreeing even when they so people will say well they mm. disagree on the fundamentals people see the world differently sometimes they agree mm. on the fundamentals and then they still disagree they disagree on the interpretation or they disagree on the consequences or they have some higher god that they don't want to admit is god and they're trying to preserve mm. that 
So a meta toe may be, why is it that there are so many toes? The whole project of theories of everything, just so you know, toe stands for theories of everything for anyone who's wondering mm -hmm. why I keep mentioning that is in part for me, in part to either put forward my own toe or for me to convince myself that someone else has a toe that is already correct. Maybe there's minor modifications that need to be made or that it's impossible for us practically to know a toe or that it doesn't exist in principle or that it's not even worth pursuing. So in part, toe is an attempt to answer any one of those questions. Mm. Yeah, it's a big project and it's a tough thing. I mean, obviously it's tough. No one's figured it out yet. So no one's definitively figured this, this whole thing out yet. What are some of the, although when I asked that question, I and mean, when you think about, um, say certain toes that have stuck out to you, and maybe they're, they're folks you have interviewed and maybe, maybe they're not, but, uh, are there any ones that you think seem that you come back to, let's say ones that keep bubbling up to the surface, let's say, or that seem to have a certain prominence that, um, that what, what rises to the top in your mind? Mainly the, okay, so there's only, there's two broad, mm. not broad ones, but broad frameworks of one or, or fields of one. Mm. So one is if whatever I'm studying currently, that's just at the forefront of my mind. Sure. And then also what I, what I don't understand. So I don't understand Bach. I don't understand his consciousness as a simulated property. I think I understand mm -hmm. it, but I don't, under, I, I don't feel like mm -hmm. I understand it. And so that comes up over and over. And I think that's it. So you want specifics. The easiest way for me to give you specifics would be if I just looked over my own channel and then gave you some. But right now I'm working on an iceberg, an iceberg of string theory. I'm so excited mm -hmm. about that, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been a video that's like a week, weeks and weeks and weeks in the making, maybe two months now, two months in the making, more than any other Toe video, just going through the last 50 years of string theory and explaining the math mm -hmm. behind it. So that's super interesting. I'm so excited by string theory. Like, mm -hmm. I don't believe it's correct, but I, I love it in the same way that I love chess. Like, I don't believe chess mm -hmm. is correct. What do you mean chess is correct? Like, sure, do kings yeah. actually operate like that? Queens operate like that? Well, yeah. some people say queen can do whatever she wants. So in some way, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's just intellectually so fascinating. Geometric unity as well. I'd like to mm. do a deep dive into maybe an iceberg, mm. a whole iceberg on that. For people mm. who are unfamiliar with the iceberg format, it's one where you explain each topic has several attributes or different subtopics within them. And then you can order them in a way that is the surface level. So it's what most people know about. Hmm, let me give an example. When it comes to theories of everything, so string theory would be there. Geometric unity may be there because many people have heard. Maybe geometric unity is on a sublayer, layer number two. There's usually about seven layers. And as you get mm. more and more deeper, you get more and more obscure, sometimes even dark, sometimes more philosophical. And it's where the fringes of the knowledge are at la layer four. So people with PhDs only know up to layer four. And then some professors know on layer five. And then layer six is just for people. You got to be, you got to be a fanatic to know layer six and seven. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I can't wait to see this. I know you've been teasing that, um, the iceberg, the a string theory video. And I think it's going to be like a two hour long epic thing. Yeah. So very excited to, to see that, um, when it, when it comes out. Okay. So we have, we have two. So, um, Yosha box, uh, computational universe. Yeah. Kind of broadly his idea. Yeah. And then Weinstein Weinstein's, um, geometric unity. No, I don't think about Eric's much. No. Oh, I'm mixing him up. Oh, who's, who's his, uh, string theory community? right now, string theory, because I'm working okay. on this video, but I am mm. interested in, in Eric's theory. So mm. he explained it to me. We met up in person and he spent hours explaining it to me. And I find it extremely interesting as well. Like super mm. interesting, man. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I have to dive in more into that. It's actually funny because the most popular video on my channel is because of Eric's work. It's on the hop vibration. 
All right. Which is, I maybe you're familiar with, uh, I barely even understand it. I made the snake and video and I can barely wrap my head around its actual significance. I do uh -huh. not really understand. He, he went on Joe Rogan a few years ago and said it was the most important object in the universe was, yeah. was his claim. And so yeah. I went down the rabbit hole of trying to understand it myself and then trying to explain it. And uh, still to this day, I can't really fully grok if it's legitimate, if it actually is this important, or if it's just a mere curiosity. I, I can't tell. Yeah, I yeah. don't agree that it's the most important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's if you asked me, gun to my head, I would say the same thing. I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, but it I has... wouldn't even put it in the top five. Yeah, me neither. But yeah. I'm sure Eric it, has his own reasons. Yeah, I assume so. Yeah. I mean, I just took that too far, perhaps too, you know, in a three hour interview with, with Rogan, you can say a lot of things and kind of be, um, but it's captured the attentions of a lot of people. So that's, that's kind of interesting. So geometric unity and Bach got it. So, yeah. And I, can you explain to me stuff. how, how is it more complicated than you have a sphere and you put bundle, you put a, a local product space of S1 on it? Mm-hmm. Like, how is it more I mean, complicated than that? I don't, I agree. I don't know. I don't understand its significance. I can understand generally that it's a mapping from a hypersphere onto what we'd say a traditional sphere. But beyond that, I don't know why it's important. It has applications in a number of different physics situations, but beyond that, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there isn't, yeah. there really is no other literature I've seen about its importance or significance. So, uh, yeah, I just have to trust what Eric says there on it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but if we might just, uh, so we'll continue. Well, it has on, an extension. Like... Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Please. Yeah. No, if you have more, this would be great if you have a context on yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Sure. That'd so, be wonderful. so there's, there's, I believe S four. So this may be incomprehensible to most people, but the sphere this regular sphere, if you take it and you just consider it as a shell hollow, otherwise it's called a mm -hmm. ball, technically a ball mm -hmm. in physics or a disc, if you take the, the circle version. So you have, to, you have to take it as hollow. That's called S2. And then if you want to go higher dimensional, then you call it S3. And lower dimensional would be S1, and that's the circle. So the circle, S1, becomes the mm -hmm. sphere, S2, becomes some higher dimensional version of the sphere, S3, and so on. Then there's S4. And... Yeah, so you were thinking of the hop vibration as taking a higher dimensional sphere, so S3, and then wrapping it around S2. Whereas I think of it as S2, but then it's, it has a local product space of S1. And those are equivalent. So in, in bundle theory, those are equivalent. You were, you were looking at it in terms of the, I believe it's called a, the homotopy. I believe it's called the homotopy. And I was thinking of it in terms of the bundle interpretation. But so mm. the easiest way for me to understand is the bundle interpretation. So it's S2. So S3 goes into S2, <laughs> which is the hypersphere yep. goes into the regular sphere. But then mm. locally, it looks like the sphere with S1, mm. which is the circle. You can generalize this to S4, so a hypersphere, locally looking like a product of that with S3. So an, another hypersphere, so that's S7 going to S4, I believe. And that has an important role in physics with, with, with what? With the anti-self-dual and self-dual Yang-Mills equations. So that's a mouthful. But that, that, there's a generalization of the hop vibration that has application in physics. As for the regular hop vibration, I don't know. I don't know much. Yeah. Well, same here. I know by far less than what you, like that you just explicated. That was more than I thought about it in a long time. But um, actually, while we're in this sort of, sort of domain here, and for folks who are listening are familiar with your with your channel, you do have a background in mathematical physics, and I'd love to talk about just mathematics broadly and just the field. Uh, you've probably you've certainly heard this uh, uh, phrase: the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Do you have an intuition? as to why mathematics is so unreasonably effective? I oscillate between thinking that it's so trivial, that it's obvious why it's so effective, and then also that it's a mm. profound statement. Like I th I'm oscillating mm. right now into it's a trivial statement. So my present deliberation, okay. is it's as foolish, thinking of the unreasonable effectiveness of, of mathematics is just as foolish as saying, I can't believe screwdrivers work. So mm. we designed screwdrivers to work. 
We have axioms. We could have chosen any act. Well, there are several axiom systems that we could have chosen that we don't. And the reason is because it does, just doesn't have application. One of the reasons why some people may wonder, man, mathematicians are pedantic. They take 200 pages in this book. I believe it's called the Principia Mathematica to prove <laughs> one plus one equals two. <laughs> okay, so then the question is like, why? Why does it take 200 pages to prove something so obvious? The answer isn't that it takes 200 pages to prove that it's obvious. It, it does do that. But the answer is that we want to know if the axiomatic system we have that's so abstract is correct. So it better prove 1 plus 1 equals 2. It takes 200 pages to get from those axioms to 1 plus 1 equals 2. But we're not trying to prove 1 plus 1 equals 2. If we had, well, if we had found that it doesn't prove 1 plus 1 equals 2, that would have invalidated the, axiom, the, ax, the axiomatic system. And we would have chosen a different one. Or keep generating until we come up with one. Luckily, I think Russell and Whitehead, Russell and Whitehead came up with that about, 200, about 100 or so years ago. If we had, yeah, we're kind of, there's the physical universe, and then we're trying to model the physical universe. And we use math to model it, but we don't use any math. We just use some parts of math. Wolfram is, by the way, trying to explore the space of all math. Mm. It's not like... The really all, Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not like... It's not like any axiomatic system works. So when people say, well, why is math so effective? You would have abandoned it if it wasn't so effective. It's what's left over that's effective. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so you don't, um, I mean, I think a lot of people, uh, myself included, probably do elevate mathematics to a certain degree and that it's, uh, it seems, uh, I'll say more fundamental. That's probably too, too strong a claim, but, uh, it's usage across domains seems to, to give it more of a, a greater weight, let's say. Uh, but you don't elevate it. It sounds like you don't particularly elevate math beyond the other disciplines or sciences? No, because, well, we could have different logical systems, some that are so mm. trivial. So right now we say there is no law of the, or there is a law of the excluded middle. And then we have other logical systems where we don't have the law of the excluded middle. But we could have had a logical system where it's just T, like there's just one letter T. And then all you can prove, quote unquote, prove are strings of T. And then we think, well, that's just, it's not interesting. Mm. But it's math. And so we don't question, well, what's the unreasonableness effective of T theories? Because we don't even consider that. So when we say the unreasonableness effectiveness, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, we're already considering the subset of math that is effective. So obviously, it's effective. Right. But I guess when I think about it in comparison to, it's really hard to think about it in comparison to other, um, I don't want to say languages, other domains, let's say. Uh, something you study in, let's say, biology. It's really difficult mm -hmm. to compare between math, right? But something you learn from biology, not necessarily applicable to something you learn in chemistry or physics or vice versa. Uh, usually it's the other way around. Usually, you know, the, there's a bit of a hierarchy in terms of what's dependent on the other levels. But uh, say something you learn from mathematics in one field, you can apply across, across multiple fields or different domains. Like, um, it just, it seems to, it's like a utility player. It seems to just have all this utility across pretty much every domain you can imagine. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's, it's interesting to hear your perspective because, uh, I think, yeah, I wasn't expect I wasn't expecting that response. What you're referring to is called universality in math. So why is, mm. why is there so much, why can you invent something in one field and then it generalizes across several? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, that. but it, it seems like, yeah. I, it, Tim, we could say, why is the hammer so effective? Like we invented the hammer to put in nails, but we can use it for several other, in several mm. other domains. 
So to me, it sounds like a question that's just either as trivial or profound. Maybe it is an extremely mm. profound question. Why is the hammer mm. so, why is the knife so effective? It can cut someone, it can chop celery. It, to me, it's on the same level. And mm. whether or not it's a, it's a profound question or, or one that's trivial depends on, to me, it's the same as, do you consider why is a knife so, why, does, why do knives have so much of an application? Sure. So if you okay. think that's gotcha. an interesting question, which it may be, mm. then, then you could think that the, the unreasonableness, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics is also an interesting question. But mm. this is my present deliberation. I, I oscillate. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I understand. And do you think, um, do you think mathematics is discovered, invented, or some combination of the two? Or something outside of those two entirely? Yeah, this is this is super interesting. I I find it difficult to make the case that it's invented. Discovered implies that there's something so you could say that there's a platonic world and that what we're doing is we're touching aspects of that or seeing veiled images as images of it or projections of it. See, in our field, Carlos, our field of podcasting on these questions, there's a conflation of truth, reality, existence, and fundamentality. So Donald Hoffman thinks that what's not fundamental isn't real. And it's, to me, that's just as silly as, again, <laughs> it's just as silly as saying like your iPhone isn't real because it's made of components or petunias aren't real mm. because they have stems and leaves. Like, okay, no one's saying petunias are doomed oh my gosh isn't that blowing your mind petunias are doomed mm -hmm. why is it that just because something's made of components your keyboard isn't real because it's made of smaller keys like no one thought that before and then and not that no one thought that before but there's a difference between something being real and being fundamental you can have the reality of mm -hmm. a chair even though chairs we don't think chairs comprise the universe mm -hmm. okay so there's a conflation of reality and fundamentality then there's also a conflation of existence and real. The question that I think about is, can you have something that exists that isn't real? Now we think, well, let's just define existence as what's real. Or let's just define what's real as existence. So firstly, then you have a tautology. But secondly, mm -hmm. or circular, a circular reasoning. Yeah. But then these are also different words with different historical roots. And I think it's extremely left-brained of us, even though I love anal analyticity, I, you and I both. It's extremely mm -hmm. left brain of us to keep abstracting and abstracting away until we just find commonalities and everything's an undifferentiated mess that's in this mm. chaotic disarray state of whatever some people think the universe emerged from. But, it's all, but what I find interesting is also to find the delineations. What are the differences? See, the right brain, the left brain likes abstraction and to see commonality. That's one of the reasons why racism is associated with the left brain, with left brain thinking. So I'm going to treat you just like any other member of your race. Whereas the right brain likes to see distinction and particulars and likes to see you as a person that's different than someone else, some other person. Just a moment. Oh, sure. Math, in some sense, is just being more and more abstract. And so the question is, is what's real what's most abstract and what's most common? Or is what's real associated with the particular? And so, as, so is math actually a reflection of something real? This is what I mean by there's the difference mm. between existence and real. Mm -hmm. When we say that it's invented or discovered, okay, if we say it's discovered, we mean that there's something there and then we pushed away some dirt and we found some core. To say that, implies that it, you have some theory, like a correspondence theory of, the, of truth. You know, there's several different theories of truth, like deflationary mm. and so on. So embedded in this statement of is math invented or discovered is an implicit confession of one's theory of truth. I don't mm. have a, a settled mm -hmm. on theory of truth, so it's extremely difficult mm. for me to say is math discovered or not. It's also 
I'm also comfortable saying that it can be a reflection of a platonic world, but the platonic world doesn't exist. Like, I'm com comfortable with saying that. Now, Penrose thinks mm. the, pen the platonic world exists, and thus math is discovered, but I think math can be discovered while what is what's being uncovered doesn't exist but is true there's a difference between truth and existence there's four concepts here that are constantly conflated reality fundamentality truth <laughs> and existence yeah okay okay you just touched on a bunch of other things i was going to ask you about but i feel like you made i think i think you made your perspective uh cl clear enough actually um hmm, i'm trying to think of where to go next here this is a, more just a fun question here. Why is, oh, after, yeah, you have another thought? No, no, I, well, just forgive me for taking some time to answer your questions because they're consequential questions. And I want to ensure that what I'm saying isn't something that is a prepared answer that mm. is staged like baseball cards that I just bring out, but rather something that I feel in the moment. Mm. It's, that's, it's difficult. Oh, yeah. Please, I'm not, uh, it's actually one of the things I admire, one of the many things I admire about you, Kurt, is that you are so thoughtful and that you will take as much time as, as you need. It's usually a few seconds, a few moments to stop and contemplate and choose your words carefully. Uh, I, think, I think your audience resonates very strongly with that. And that's actually something, a quality I wish I had more of my, for myself, instead of uh, starting a sentence not knowing where it's going to end, if I just take a second and fewer ums and uhs and likes and i'll be more precise and uh so you're a good model to to follow i think um more of a fun question so, you know i started off i wish i had started this thing off a little lighter <laughs> we could have built we could have started us <laughs> I, off i wanted to make sure yeah. that we got to these questions but a fun one why is 157 your favorite number oh that's a man you've done your homework so where did you hear that I'm sure I'm certain I heard it from you. I can't recall. I don't take I take pretty diligent notes, but not necessarily where I heard it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm the it same. Probably I'm the same. It's probably an offhand. It's probably an offhand no, comment it, you made yeah, that I, it's I scribbled offhand, it down. But it's also serious. Now the reason is is quite secretive. True. But so I'm a secretive person. <laughs> Just so you don't, know, Carlos. I could tell by the way you take <laughs> notes. <laughs> your own personal <laughs> notes. Your note taking yeah. your system. Yeah, it's <laughs> it, it's not secretive out of privacy. It's it's something else that I haven't put my finger on. It's not protection. Maybe it's distinctiveness. I don't know. I don't know. But the reason for that, so I have a, well, I can tell you a bit off air about that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I'll just get a note of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm very comfortable. Any question? And please, I, I should have said but, okay, this Okay, but there's also, con there's, there's, there's also synchronicity with that number. So mm -hmm. one of my favorite courses in university was MET 157 at the University of Toronto. Hmm. So that's the first year real analysis course. It's your first, like, you get, talk about going in without lube when you just went into this <laughs> podcast with the hard questions straight away. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's the Toe Podcast as well, and that's Matt157 as well. You go hmm. from high school to proving that the proof of induction works. Like, it's extremely theoretical. It's your first taste of actual math. And it's one of my favorite courses, Matt157. Matt157. But, but there are several, there are a couple other reasons. Again, I'll talk to you about hmm. them off air. Absolutely, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll probably, I'll, maybe I'll interject some of these lighter things in between some of the harder, because as you pointed out, these are, these are questions that aren't easy to answer. If they were, then they weren't, wouldn't probably worth, be worth discussing in the first place. The, but I do want to touch back on something you said about truth. And, um, funnily enough, this, my channel used to be called the truth with Carlos Farias. That was the initial for the first couple of years of my channel. It's actually what I named it. It was more of a placeholder than anything else. But after a while, I found that it was just too haughty and, and it was just too bloated and yeah. had all these. And also, I don't think necessarily, but I think this actually might be counter to something I, I heard you say on an AMA that I'm not sure that objective truth, whatever we could say that is, is actually 
the highest value or is even in the tier of the highest values. But I would love to know where sort of your position on that is and what does truth mean to you? It's the enlightened position or the rational position to think that, hey, whatever's truthful is what's most good. Mm. I think it's an implicit position. I don't know if that's the case. So firstly, one has to define what they mean by truth. And that's not so simple as we've discussed. Mm -hmm. yep. If you just mean you correspond to facts, cold and calculated. I, I don't know why truth implies some goodness. Now, you may say historically it's the case that the more we know, the more good we are. Okay, firstly, let's, what is this definition of good that you refer to? And how do you prove that the more that we know, the more good we are? How do you know that there's not something? Oh, gosh. Jeez. So one of my quotes I can barely say is, this comes from Lovecraft. And it's that one of the most merciful aspects of this world is the inability for the human mind to correlate its contents. And that as soon as we do, this unfettered scientific investigation may reveal such terrifying vistas of reality in our frightful position therein that will either go mad from the revelation or flee from the light to the peace and safety to the peace and safety of the darkness. Yeah, there's no guarantee that you just learn more and it's just a net good. There's no guarantee about that. Mm. Like, the, the, it's one of the reasons that people don't want to study. I, I, I can't even say it, but politically speaking, there are certain political topics that someone could be something you could study, but people don't want to because, well, we don't want to find out our, the answer there. Again, I don't want to. I know. Well. Yeah, to me, it's just not, it's not clear at all. It's not clear. So something is more valued than truth. Or you can just say, you want truth for what? You can just ask someone, for what? They say, for truth's sake? What does that mean? You want truth for truth's sake? Most of the time, they'll say, because it's, it leads to some better outcome. Okay, so why not pursue that better outcome? Okay, because the best way to pursue it is with the truth. Okay, is that guaranteed? What if it wasn't the case? What if someone made the case that is not Oh, okay. And I get a bit frustrated about this because, see, just like there are buzzwords, there are these buzz phrases that people use, like, like pursue truth, or I'm a truth seeker. And mm. there's this writer of, of Seinfeld named Peter, Peter Melman, or Peter, I think Peter Melman. I'll correct it if I'm. If I hmm, make a mistake, yeah. or you'll correct me. I can put it in the description. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He said that there are different storylines in Seinfeld. Like the the one about the car, the smelly car, with the 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 bus. No, the, the valet, the valet who went in <laughs> and funked up the car for the rest of the the yeah, show. Yeah. So there are different storylines, and the story is that. Someone in the writer's room, they would always pitch Larry different stories. And Larry David would say like, no, 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 it's not good enough, not good enough. And then someone was just telling them about, telling him about their day. And then he's like, that's a Seinfeld episode. That's a Seinfeld episode right there. The guy didn't even think about it like that. Mm. Peter Melman said, Larry was great at picking up on what would be a great storyline. Like someone snubs you because you ordered a salad and not something more substantive at the restaurant. And so the waitress is a bit upset because of the tip. Like Larry, Larry um, David would pick up on it like that. And um, it would just go over most people. I think that part of one's calling in life can be, you can phrase it as what, what is that filter that you have, that sieve that you have, that net that you have, that nothing escapes it. Almost nothing escapes it, but it escapes other people. Yeah. So for me, I have a similar observational bent as Larry and 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 Larry David and Seinfeld in the sense that like I'm I'm just a 
I'm, I'm observing, but I'm not an observational comedian. Like I'm not in comedy. Mm. So something that, I, that stands out to me, like, like a, like a splinter is when people say phrases that they are saying because they're intellectually posturing or that they want to sound enlightened and deep and profound and they don't know what it means or they've heard it from somewhere else and they're copying it. Mm. It just stands out to me like that. I see it on mm. in written text. I see it in different interviews of people. I see it in myself when I'm being interviewed. Maybe that's why I see it because I, I'm, I'm such sure. a harsh critic of myself, even though I don't think I'm a harsh critic, but mm -hmm. I think that's part of being a harsh critic. It, I'm, I'm a critic of myself. And so I see this quality in myself or at least a seed in my former self. And it, it takes, took years to, to minimize it. And it becomes so blatantly obvious in other people. It just doesn't pass my filter. I, I see it with many, even some of the guests that I, that I interview. Well, yeah, more so I see it in, in other podcasters. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> oh, yeah. don't worry oh, don't shit. worry no, no. you're like <laughs> no it's okay it's no. okay no 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 i feel like many podcasters become them. podcasters because they want to not because they care about the ideas but because they want to be a thought leader and they see oh, this sure. as somehow getting the credibility of the guests that they mm. interview and that people will want to hear from them more and more and more mm. so yeah yeah different it's anyhow yeah. You, yeah, you'd mentioned this kind of reminds me of something that you'd mentioned on an AMA that um, it's like when you're watching a film or television, you can you can spot lazy dialogue very quickly, like throw away when there's just something. It's just not meaningful. It's not progressing the story. It's just and the most I mean, separately, if you're talking about podcasts in general, and I, I think most media just cut it books. TV, whatever you want, to, art, 99% of it is not worth consuming, in my opinion. There's so much of it. I mean, that's a very critical statement. Don't get me wrong. I'm not yeah. saying that my stuff is in the 1%. I'm not uh, claiming right, that at right. all. I'm not claiming sure. that. Um, but I do think a selective, a sort of a selective uh, filter mm -hmm. is a good thing, although you, you meant it in a slightly different way. The One of the things I wanted to ask you about was... Yes, when you were, I'm not sure if you're still directing any films or if you have that um, any near-term plans to do that again. But um, I did want to ask you about because I watched I'm Okay. I oh, watched boy. that. It was early. It was last year at some point, but oh, I did boy. watch it. That's... And I, well, I mean, because you bring up, and I thought while watching it, this is some combination, or maybe I might be stealing a quote from a, a snippet. Someone said a combination of Woody Allen and Larry Davids, something like that. It's, that's sort of the, um, the thoughts too, that was happening there. And I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I know we had this back and forth a little bit. You said <laughs> a cringe, I think was the word you used. Yeah. Um, geez, Louise, man. Even you bringing this up right now. Like, no, I but white, I'm going to, I'd be red. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll link to it in the description so folks can actually watch it if they want to. Because I know you don't, you don't talk about it on the on the podcast that much, and understandable. I mean, you're talking about other things, other topics. But I wanted to talk about that experience, perhaps a little bit. Or what did you, uh, what did you learn from? If you have any learnings from that, from that uh, that production? Oh gosh, oh boy, this is the most uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable question. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Let's see. Yeah yeah well it's much harder to make a a film than i thought i remember mm. when i was filming that i had i thought i knew what it's like to work hard this happens so frequently mm. like even with this mm. podcast i thought i knew what it was like to work hard until i did the film or until i did the podcast but we're talking about the film mm. there were times where i didn't even have it takes like 10 seconds to check your messages. I didn't even have time to check my messages unless it was directly related to work. I remember going to sleep. It takes me so long to fall asleep. It took me like an instance back then. I was just so exhausted wow. filming all day, waking up immediately going to work and then immediately finishing. I set myself this unfathomable goal of finishing a film in 60 days. So finishing the filming and editing of a feature film in 60 days of one that's not something 
of one that's not something trivial like you film in one location and it's one long shot because then that needs sure, minimal yeah. editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was that taught me what it's like to work extremely, extremely formidably. Another is that you shouldn't feed people pizza constantly. I was so cheap, man. I had this small budget night, and, and everyone would come hoping that there's this is this is something on film sets, by the way. Do yeah, not feed sure, sure. Pizza, it's known. Mm. It's like a joke that you're not supposed to that your 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 food on set is supposed to be substantive. And I'm mm. just giving pizza every time, and they would be so disappointed. I would oh god, because I I could I love food, but me too. Yeah, I'm with, I'm on the same one. track as you. That reminds me of a book I read when I was a kid. I don't know why I read it because I don't have a, a directing impulse or an artistic or creative. Well, I have a creative side, I guess, but it was called what they don't teach you in film school. It was like 130 lessons or tips. And I, I remember devouring it as a child. Just being like, this is really interesting. The, the behind the scenes and they talk about, yes, what kind of food to, to feed and to actually feed your mm -hmm. people how they expect it. Um, yeah. Uh, who what else well, you i guess you from that book i mean that was a long time ago yeah. i remember just soaking that up you remember just random things you read as a kid that you're like why did that you thing were interested in being a filmmaker before no i wasn't i mean and i wasn't after reading the book either i don't know why i picked that <sighs> book up i think it was just at the library and it was an easy read and it was very it was written by i'll link to the description as well i have to like go and, and find where this book is um or who wrote it but I think I liked the, uh, they were just, it was like kind of like startup vibe that they were just throwing things together and learning at, you know, learning a rapid pace and trying to create something. And it was very inspirational. I want to say, I remember being just, just being in awe of like, oh, this is, I didn't realize I was probably 10 when I read it and I didn't realize even what a director was of like, oh, there's a president of a movie. Like they get to decide, <laughs> oh, okay. They're, they're organizing mm. the whole thing. So, um, it opened my eyes to that, that frame. Now we're all, we, we have some exposure, I think to a lot of people do anyways, the production process and, and how, that, how that goes to be. But, um, but speaking of oh, projects, here's something though, else I would learn. Sorry, quickly. Oh, yeah, so just please. Yes. Specific, yes. Specific. A specific yeah, lesson yeah. is pay more for the actors because the actors mm. carry the movie so mm. mine didn't have known actors or even well i don't want to disparage anyone but it's not as if acting is the strong suit of that of that film i think the writing is not bad and the directing is not bad but the the, the acting including on my own part by the way i was in the film so it's not the it's not terribly great yeah no i think i pointed out when i messaged you about it last year it was uh my favorite parts, I think the script writing, yes, and the cinematography, um, some of the shots in particular, uh, was really kind of st stuck out, and I thought they, they were excellent. So oh, speaking of projects, um, are you currently writing a book on paradoxes, consciousness, and free will? How's You've that going? You've done your homework, man. Jeez. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. So people who are watching this, if you don't know who mm -hmm. Carlos is, I'm sure you do. Like, this guy, this guy studies, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm writing a book. I'm, I'm, it doesn't have a publisher. I'm not. It's it's to get my own thoughts straight. This is something that I've seen. So sometimes people come on the show or come on any show, and then they're like, "Yeah, they're just promoting a book," and then they'll call mm. someone a grifter. I'm like, that's a, a phrase that needs to be eliminated from someone's vocabulary. There are a few hide bounding mm. repudiational words that just limit you. Mm. That I think should be eliminated. I keep a catalog of them. Anyhow. I used to feel that way as well. Like, oh, they're just promoting their book until I start to look more into it. Number one, it turns out writing a book is one of the worst ways to make money because oh, sure. it turns out hours yeah. per what you mm -hmm. get back. Number two, writing is such a great way to sort your own thoughts out. One of my favorite mm. books is Gerdel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. Oh, same here. Yeah, you got it. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. I have the same one. Same one. Always in arm's reach of this book. <laughs> and that is just, that to me is like the epitome of what mm -hmm. it is to write a book, where you mm -hmm. see someone wrestling with ideas on the page and then coming to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. That to me is like, it's not only book writing, it's art. It's when you don't know what you're doing and you're trying to do something and you're exploring it through the process of writing or through the process of filming or through the process of painting. 
Jung would say if you knew what you were doing prior and you kept sticking to that, that was, that was what he would call propaganda. Mm. So he thought propaganda was more than political propaganda. It was you just trying to convince the audience of something instead Mm. of trying to find out something yourself through the art. Anyhow, yeah, I'm writing it bit by bit. I have about seven book ideas and I'm writing them little by little here and there. Awesome. Yeah. So it's just like a work in progress. Do you have a a target date? Yeah. My my target date keeps changing, man. Mm. So understandable yeah. there's this guy named leonardo da vinci <laughs> everyone i'm sure you've heard, heard of him everyone yeah. yeah 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 <laughs> who so there's this guy this think guy it means DiCaprio. <laughs> yeah so so leo here yeah leo if you read his biography by walter isaacson mm. i resonate deeply with with da vinci it's uh he firstly had an adhd mindset secondly he was solitary like he learned almost everything he learned alone and mm. it's a lonely lonely life at least my life is extremely lonely I don't have mm. friends, not in person. I have people I text, but it's a, it's a intellectually lonely life. I, I have my wife and that satisfies like every possible need, but we don't talk about anything that's academic. Yeah. And so I resonate completely with, with Leonardo da Vinci, something from him, from his book, from Walter Isaacson's book of his is that. There's a refrain like, and Leonardo started this, but he would never finish. Da, da, da. He would start this, but never finish. Never <laughs> finish. Or, or he thought it would uh, take yeah. him like a few months and it would take him years. Right. So right, that's right. right now where the books are at. Hofstadter's Law. Right? Yeah. I think that's Hofstadter's Law. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. And also, I mean, speaking of Gerlach Bach, how incredible is it that that book won the Pulitzer Prize, I believe? Wait, let me see. Did it? Yeah, it won the Pulitzer Prize, but it was also like mm-hmm. a very popular book. I think in the, I don't know how many, how many copies it sold, but I wonder if it came out today, how well it would do. Um, That's the goal for this book but... that I'm working on is oh, I okay. want it to be technical for someone who is at the undergraduate level or an extremely bright and motivated high school level, hmm. but still somehow be a book that would be at the front or near the front of a bookstore. I don't know how mm. to do that. I don't know how to yeah. do that now. I don't know how he did it then. Yeah, I don't know. That's so tough uh, uh, to pull off. One of the things that reminds me, of, this is a con- complete tangent, if you don't mind, but sure. it's related to, and maybe it'll even help perhaps, but when you say that, the thing, I, the person I think of Someone whose whose name comes up a lot, I'm sure, but you're familiar with Joe Rogan, I'm sure. Yes, but not his podcast. His when he commentates on UFC fights, and I'm not a UFC fan. I'm not a fighting fan. Uh, I have other. I like other sports, but not UFC. I've watched though a handful of the fights that he calls, uh-huh. and I think he does an impeccable job of explaining things to a level of detail where a a total novice to the sport can appreciate it. And yet there's detail and specifics to the point where I know advanced viewers will get a lot out Mm -hmm. of it. Mm. It's a weird confluence of things. I mean, it's so strange, but I, I watched, I've watched a few fights and I think to myself, he's the best announcer I've ever heard in sports of a sport. I don't care about Mm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, which is a very interesting kind of angle and perspective. And uh, and I'm a, I, I don't really listen to his podcast too too often. Occasionally, I do if it's a, a guest I particularly want to hear from. But uh, I think he does. Perhaps he has that kind of appeal in a sense in a po- in this podcast. But where it's really great, where his expertise is the best, is with the UFC fight. So I'll just make that make that random comment there. You work incredibly hard. <laughs> you know this. I'm amazed and admire your work ethic. I wish I had an ounce of it. I wish I had just a sliver of it because I don't have the same drive that you seem to have. Can you attribute that to anything in particular? Do you think it's just an innate quality? Do you think it's something you built up? Something I built, but it's also insecurity. It's I'm mm. a deeply insecure person. Mm. And so I just, I, 
I know that my drive for wanting to be the best at what I do, the best, the best, the best, it has to be the best, has to be the best. I know that comes from, mm. or I, I believe it comes from, if I was to psychoanalyze myself something from when I was 17 and I was so heartbroken by a girl, so heartbroken, man. like you wouldn't <laughs> believe. And it just left this indelible wound that is still wow. there. I'm not hung up over any woman, wow. any woman, but, but my, my past shapes me. And I know it's there. There's another quote, by the way, from Leonardo da Vinci this time. So one of my favorite quotes of his. I said I resonated with him because, well, several reasons. He integrated several disparate fields. He was a generalist, but at the same time being a specialist, which is something that I, I aspire to do. And he also had a bit of pride in him, but he rarely let it shine through he also didn't like to mm. speak about himself much you get this from his mm. writings like being i don't know if, if people know but i'm uncomfortable being interviewed i just don't like being interviewed i feel like one i don't have much to say i'm i'm uninteresting i it's also it, it takes so much from me no i think like, i'm honored to be here man i'm honored to be here and I'm honored all the on, people man. who would interview me like i'm glad it's you mm. <laughs> But anyway, this, this, there's many qualities I like from Leonardo. One of them is, is, he said, one of all the notes, and I think his notebook, by the way, his, his, I have his notebook somewhere here, his sketch note, his drawing notebooks, the ones of sketches, is more valuable than his paintings. I'm not a fan of his paintings, mm. but I love his sketches and his notebooks. And one of the quotes, or one of the writings he wrote was to some nebulous competitor it's not named and it may not even been a, a single person it just may be you can cock someone as an as a as an enemy in your in your mind he said he was talking about why they'll never beat him and he said you will he's like constructing this this scenario he's like where he was whereas leonardo was examining cadavers and he would do that because he wanted right. to know how do the muscles work and no other painter even thought to go there like, why would you open someone up? Why does that have anything mm. to do with art? Mm. So he said, you will perhaps be deterred by your stomach. Or you will be, yeah, you will perhaps be deterred by your stomach. And if that doesn't get you, then, you, then the fear of living in close quarters with quartered corpses and flayed flesh will, frightful to behold. And if you have mm. that, if you surpass that, then you'll lack the draftsmanship and you won't be as good with the pen. And if you have that, then you'll lack the knowledge of perspective. Remember, Leo was the first one of the first to have perspective in his paintings. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, if that were so accompanied, then you will lack the geometric methods of calculating forces on the muscle. And if you have that, then you will simply lack the patience and not be so diligent. So in other words, so something that I resonate with is like, look, you have to have the drive. You have to have the, the skill or the knack for this. You have to also have methods. Even if you have all of those, you're not going to outwork me. So. That's that's in me. That's just a, a a deep insecurity of mine that that drives that. Maybe drives it for Leonardo. I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, no, that's that's deeply personal. So, hmm. would you say you have any living role models? No, I asked my wife this. And then she said, Andrew Huberman. I'm like, babe, I don't even talk about, I just talk about Andrew Huberman about the sunlight, <laughs> but I talk about it so frequently because I'm like, we need to get, get more sunlight, sunlight in into our eyes. your eyes. Yes. I'm, yeah. I'm like, babe, I don't even talk about Andrew Huberman other than the sunlight, but I do it so often. She's like, mm, maybe it's Andrew uh, Huberman. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> like uh, that, but that was, I found so hilarious and offensive. <laughs> hmm. Oh, ouch. Burn but, Huberman. But no, 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 no. no I, know. Just, just, I, I know. No. Yes. No, there's nothing against <laughs> Andrew Huberman, I think he's like one of the best, if not the best at what he does. I remember when he yeah, great. was first doing his podcast and it was lectures. I don't even know why he called them podcasts, but I guess you can label any long form content where you talk as mm. podcast. And he was mm. doing so. And I was thinking, this guy has the best, the best podcast, the best. And I, yeah, he has the best. Yeah. Anyhow, I don't even yeah. watch his podcast or I haven't in a, in a long while. So it wouldn't be Huberman. No, it'd be a far cry from that. It, it, I don't know. I don't know. 
I think that there's a couple. Yeah, yeah. So I'm rebelling against something, Carlos. I'm mm. I'm rebelling against my former self, where I was so uncreative. I would just imitate. I'd find a role model or two and imitate them. And I think there's like I think there's three stages of learning or three stages of life. One where you imitate, and then the second where you you inculcate or you integrate. That's that. That's another buzz phrase I don't like to use, but integrate. And then the third is that you individuate. So the inter so first you go through this phase of imitating someone, and then second, then the it, the individuation phase or the in, sorry the integration phase is where you 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 can now disagree with your idols. I think that's where you can find honesty. By the way, like your true feelings mm. are when there's someone you hold with high regard, and you say, "Here's where they're wrong." Mm. That's at mm. least for me. And then the individuation phase, I've, I've forgotten forgotten how that goes. I don't think I meant that. But anyhow, I'm rebelling against myself having models, and so I, I don't, because I find it too difficult for me to not imitate them. Right. One of the things you just mentioned about, yes, I'd say picking out the things that you disagree with uh, with somebody, and it's related to something you said earlier, or perhaps a thought I had while you were speaking, is that uh, uh, from personal experience, when I, because I, uh, I think we, mm -hmm. we have a lot in common here. You've mentioned on AMA is that you're quite judgmental or that you once were very, very judgmental. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I think I feel the same way. Uh, it's something I'm working on, trying to get better about. But when I'm observant about the things like that I criticize in the world, mostly exterior, let's say, mm -hmm. and this happens rarely, but when I'm able to realize that the thing I'm really criticizing is a fault I have in myself, it's like the exterior, it's like the outside world. Those are symbols. It's like a, it's like a sign. And it, it usually mm -hmm. I'm just scoff and go off and just say, Oh no, that's wrong. That's, but if I take the time to analyze it, I'm saying pretty much always, I can't even think of instances where this is not the case. I realize, oh, wait, I've done that. I do that all the time. Mm. And actually, bec because I've noticed it, it's like this weird, it's like a, re a reflection or a mirror of something that I need to work on. Um, it's something, it's so prevalent and so common that and perhaps it's just my own experience. Uh, I've, I've talked to friends about this and they don't seem to share that. Um, but it's, it's a, something I've noted in the past couple of years that I can't shake. For that me, I, feel, I, I find 99% of my criticisms of any one and also of the theories that they develop. So I'm also attacking those come from jealousy. So I'm an emulous mm. and desirous and rivalrous person. I'm an envious mm. person. Almost all of my criticisms of other people come from something that's not rational, even though I would say, well, look, no, this, it's just obvious that they're wrong because of reasons A, B, and C. Yeah. That's just for me, though. Yeah. So to, it's... it's Total left field here, but you mentioned the word rationality there, so I'm going to jump on that. Something you're really, or you were interested in, Newcomb's, parado Newcomb's Paradox. Mm -hmm. And I can't say I've done a deep dive into this, but I've just barely scratched the surface of it the last couple of days. I can't understand, and perhaps for the audience, if you, if you wouldn't mind um, ex explain, like setting it up, perhaps, so you, you, I'm sure you could do a better job than I could. Um, but I can't understand where the real issue lies. So <laughs> would you mind if, if, if you could uh, to explain it a bit and then we could talk about, talk it out a little bit. Okay. Let's suppose there's a genie and okay. Let's suppose there's a magical, no, I, I got to remove supercomputer because then that, yeah, let's just say that there's a supercomputer that, that you enter this room. It scans your brain. And it knows the decisions you're going to make, particularly, in particular, the decisions on this 
problem. There's two boxes in front of you. One of the boxes you can't see through. It's a wooden box. Then the, another, the next box is, let me just, it has $1,000 and it's transparent. Mm -hmm. So it's glass, a glass box. You're told, look, you can do, there are two actions you can take. You can take both boxes and you keep all the money that's inside them. So in the, in the wooden box, maybe there's some money inside, maybe there's not, but at least you see the glass box. So you can choose. Do I take the wooden box only? This is the choice being given to you by the supercomputer. Do I take only the wooden box or do I take both boxes? You're thinking, well, why not just take both boxes? There's some amount of money in the, in the wooden mm -hmm. one. I don't know how much, but let me just take both because I'll get the amount that's in the wooden one. Plus I'll get the glass one, the 1000. Okay. The computer says, Hey, here, there's a catch. So firstly, what's in this wooden box is either going to be nothing or it's going to be a million dollars. Okay, now you're thinking, well, that's even better. Let me just take both boxes. I'll either get $1,000 or I'll get a million plus $1,000. Then the, says, the computer says, actually, there's, a, there's another catch. That's not it. If you're, I've scanned your brain, by the way. I've scanned your brain. And I figured out if you're a greedy person. If you're the greedy person that 1 million doesn't satisfy you, you want 1 million plus 1,000. So you try to take both boxes. I've actually put nothing in the box. So I'm going to punish your greed. If you're the not altruistic, but less selfish person who's just going to trust and take what's inside the, the wooden box, I've put in 1 million in there. So this, then you're like, well, do I trust this computer and so on? Well, you can imagine this computer has played this game across 1 billion people and has never predicted incorrectly. If someone tried to take both boxes, and by the way, as soon as you enter the room, this decision's already like this, this decision to put one million mm. or not is made instantly. Mm. Okay. And it's always been correct. This computer has always been correct. So then the question is, what do you do? So it sounds like there's no paradox because, well, why don't I just not be greedy and take the wooden box? Because if history is correct, then punishes greed. I want 1 million, so I'm not going to even attempt to take that transparent 1,000 box. I'm just going to take my wooden box. Now, the, the paradox comes in because there's two types of rationality. There's epistemic rationality, and then there's instrumental rationality. And usually these are aligned. And that's why when someone's like, I'm a rational person, I'm like, yeah, which kind of rationality? Why do you think that one ranks supreme? What do you do in the scenarios where they conflict? Where they conflict? Conflict, sorry. So epistemic rationality is using logic and deduction to come to conclusions. And then that's the one that would say, well, just a moment. Mm -hmm. the second, so let me just explain what epistemic rationality is. That's the one that tries to maximize your utility. So the one that wants to maximize your utility would say, look, the, the history shows that if I was to take the wooden box, then I get 1 million. History also shows if I take both, I only get 1,000. So let me take the wooden box. So I'm going to maximize my utility. Then the rational one would say, yes, but that decision's already been made. It's there. It's already there. So why can't you just decide right now to take both boxes? Whether there's 1 million or not in the trunk, in the, in the wooden box, that dis that, that's there. Whether, whether you take both or not. There's another variation where someone else is a friend and can see in the wooden box, by the way, from the back. Right, right, right. So anyway, the, the, the question is, why don't you just take both boxes? If the decision has been made already. Anyhow, that's it. Can I ask, what, what would you do? I would take the, the wooden box only. Just one box, the million, the million yeah. dollar box, not both. Yeah. 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 So this Look, is if something, I lose a thousand, so what? But you, yeah, there's a variation I... where it's like a vaccine and your wife is dying and oh, yeah. one has like one box has 80% of the vaccine. So the transparent one has 80% mm. of the vaccine and the other one has the other 20%. So you can for sure cure her if you get both or I mm. may have flipped it, but either way, the yeah. person who's listening can, can construct a variation for themselves of Newcomb's Paradox, where it's a vaccine for someone that you love, your child. And if you get both, right. you get 100% of the vaccine, but if you just choose one, you only get a part of it. Then the question is, what do you do? And in that case, you find people switch. They want to take both boxes. Right, right.
it's like a ref- it's like the trolley problem being reframed versus saving five lives versus killing five people mm-hmm. or, or the va- vice versa. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. What were you going to say, Carlos? No, no, no. That was wonderful. The uh, thank you for summarizing it because I, I could not have done um, as, as great a job as that. The thing I so I, I don't think it's that. I probably don't understand it well enough. I have to set this up this way. I think it all relies on how much you trust the supercomputer's prediction. And it's just like that value of what, what percentage chance do you think, or how likely it is you think that they made the prediction that goes either against your, let's say against your favor. Because if you trust it, that it's right, let's say it's never been wrong a billion times, it seems quite obvious to just take one box and just trust it. <laughs> I, I, I don't really see, I, I feel like there's really simple math that would just say, yes, just take the one box. I, I can't wrap my head around why you would ever want to take both. And so that's, so clearly I'm wrong because this is a famous paradox. I just can't understand why. <laughs> Yeah, the reasoning goes, if the money is there or not already, the decision's been made. Why can't you, with your own free will right now, mm-hmm. just go and choose both? Like, what I difference choose does both, choosing but, both make? But if the, the supercomputer... to include... Right, but the supercomputer, there's a bit of a the tricky part. I don't say causality gets involved here, but the, the decision's already been made by the, by the supercomputer. They've predicted... I'm going to take one or, or the other, uh, or both, let's say. Even if it's predicted that you're only going to take one, though, and it put the one million yeah. in, why can't mm-hmm. you just take both and get a million and a thousand? Your job is to maximize the amount of money that you get. So let's say mm-hmm. it predict. Yeah, anyway. I understand that it's... Uh, yeah, I probably just don't understand it well enough. <laughs> That's what I was like hoping, but... Because it, it, it just just seems very straightforward to me, but I am probably miss, I probably have this huge blind spot that I cannot understand because I, because I know that it's, yeah, you, you said epistemic versus was it instrumental? I, I've seen it yeah. phrase a dominance principle versus expected utility principle. Um, there's also a frame. The thing I thought of, the first thing I thought of was this thing from poker that I read a poker paper many years ago. It was about counterfactual regret minimization. So it made me think of, yeah, what would be, what would minimize my regret after the fact? It's like an older, it's like another way of perceiving. I don't, I don't think it falls really under the, uh, sure. the envelope of this problem, but yes, if you were to try to take both and then you got nothing, that's so much worse than just taking, just take the million. This is kind of, it's also, yeah, it alludes to something we were talking about earlier a little bit in terms of it's sort of, maybe it's like, sort of, we are getting close to this like, sort of pragmatic discussion, maybe it was on truth or something, but I remember thinking like, just don't overthink it. Just take the million. Um, but of course you can, you can, you can move the numbers around to make it closer. Or mm-hmm. to exactly. That's why the ambiguous. variations so, with, with so, so, yeah. like, half a million here, half a million there, or it's a vaccine right. are more important. So, because yeah. The, yeah. otherwise most people think I don't care if I don't get the extra 1000, but that's not the point. The point is your task right. is to maximize the amount. If you don't maximize, if you were wrong, let's say you get, okay, maybe that should be the variation. If you were wrong, mm. you get shot right afterward. Mm. If you don't get the full, if right. you don't get the maximum amount that you could have gotten, then you, you're shot right after, right outside the room at Newcomb's room. Right. Yeah. Right outside of Newcomb's room. Yeah. I need to think I about how to phrase that. The, the, <laughs> The roulette version, the Russian roulette version. I didn't think about that. But I think that would yeah, make absolutely. it more clear that there's a paradox here. Yeah. I have to, I, I think I, I, did, yeah, I need to dive into it more. Maybe folks in the comments will, uh, would love to explain it or clear up this blind spot that I clearly have. Um, a few other questions I had for you. Have you seen The Boy and the Heron yet? No. It's a, Is it good? You're a fan of Miyazaki, right? Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I know you're a fan of his. I've actually never seen another film of his. I have to watch like Spirited Away and some of the other. <laughs> okay. It was my first. I did not love it. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. I, I thought it was beautiful I heard but boring. That. I heard that. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I went in with an open mind and the reviews were pretty great, generally, from critics oh, anyway. I heard that from the user mm. reviews. 
that mm. most people who are Miyazaki fans were disappointed. Okay, good. Okay, then that tracks. Okay, that that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> I was I almost left the theater, but uh, wow. <laughs> stuck around. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I'll I'll, I'll walk out of a movie. Yeah, I'm uh, wasting another hour. Um, but I stuck around hoping it would it would change. But how, um, how many movies have you walked out on in your, in your life? Oh, how many? Actually, not too many. I mean, I, I'm talking a big game there. Probably a dozen. Wow, that's plenty, man. That's plenty. Oh, is that plenty? Yeah, I yeah, walked out of I two think... in my entire life. I stick with the ship. Band. Which one? Stick until which one? <laughs> Do you remember which movie? Steve. Yeah, the Steve Jobs with Ashton Kutcher. Oh. I was like, this is just so horrible. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Right, right. Sure, I'm sure. Unbearable. Mm. And then one time I was given a free ticket. This is probably why I stay because mm. I'm an extremely frugal person. So I'm like, I've same here. It. Some yeah. cost is just my is my motto. Yeah. I should have that tattoo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was one for. I think it was some re- live action remake of Pocahontas or it's heavily inspired by Pocahontas, but it wasn't. Yeah. And it was a live action one. It mm. was years and years, like 10, 15 years ago. Couldn't bear mm. it. Oh my gosh. Oh man. That sounds terrible. The most <laughs> uh, recently I haven't, I've thought of walking out of stuff, but the first, I remember one of the first ones when I was like, Freddie oh. got fingered with um, yeah. Tom something. <laughs> Tom Green. I remember walking out of it, just big. This is awful. I can't even. What was the other one? Do you have another one? You just yeah, I, I I misremembered. It wasn't the one with the the live action Pocahontas. It, it was King's Speech. I left that, and I know that's an Academy oh, Award win. Interesting. Win movie. People loved it. Yeah, I couldn't bear it. I could not bear it. Interesting. I liked it. Yeah, it's funny. I remember seeing. I didn't think it deserved Best Picture that year. Uh, Social Network was my Best Picture winner personally that year. But it lost to King's Speech. When, what year know. was that? I want to say 2011. I'm not sure. Mm, okay, around. okay. It was within a year or two of then, I'm pretty sure. I mean, you must be a film, but have you seen anything lately that's caught your eye? Anything that? No, no, I, I, I haven't. So I decompress now at nighttime. I used to just watch dark dramas, but now I don't. Mm. I just watch something light. So there's, but 2007 and 2008 were a great year for films for me i i mm. loved no country for old men and there will be oh, yes. and sweeney todd and those all came out oh yeah year. crazy i was just a buddy of, yeah. was yeah. a buddy of mine the other day was it's one of the best films skinning yeah a few days ago my, a friend we were talking about favorite movies of all time and no country for old men is one of mine it's up there for sure that parasite is another one that comes to mind i have to think about rounding out the top five but those two are definitely in that kind of discussion yeah. um i want to ask you about gaming too because what do you have any favorite video games i know you don't have time to play them yeah. now but maybe when you were you yeah know, i was playing baldur's time. gate recently baldur's gate's not bad uh, i st- i don't see what the hype is about i think it's a fantastic like a, a, it's mm. an extremely fantastic game but i i don't see it as being for sure game of the year zelda was great mm. the new Zel- the new zelda though it, to me it didn't provide much that was different from the first one. I was disappointed in that. Even though I love the mechanics in the new Zelda. The Breath, mm. the Breath of the Wild. Tears of the Kingdom. Mm. Then mm, Metal Gear is my favorite series. Love Metal oh, Gear. Oh, yes. I love Metal Gear. I remember playing that as a kid, yeah. On the PlayStation. Yeah. I'm so That's sad about Metal Gear game. Solid 5, though. Metal Gear Solid 5 is such a disappointment to me. Was that the open world one? Yeah, it's such a disappointment. Mm. It's like the same areas over and over. Mechanically, it's tight. So tight. Mm. Like the tightest of all yeah. Metal Gears. But I care about the story and I care about variety. And I know sure. Hideo Kojima. By the way, that's like someone, my dream list person on the podcast. Kojima, yeah. Hideo I know. That's why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, yeah, I, I didn't get into five. Yeah, I didn't get into five. I think I put 15 hours in and then I just kind of went, eh, I don't know. Yeah. I, it, didn't, it didn't take me. And the same thing with Starfield. Oh, and and it's a different voice as well for Solid Snake. Like the classic David Hater that uh, everyone knows and loves from MGS one, two, three, four, four. You're gonna abandon for level five for number five? Yeah, sorry, which one? No no more <laughs> Is that what you said? No, uh, Starfield. I tried playing Starfield, right. A right, few right. months ago. My goodness, I couldn't unplayable. I, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> hated it. I mean, load screen after load screen, just what is going on? The 
Yeah. I did another one. That's I put 15, 20, hours, 20 hours in. Yeah, it was too bad. Do you like, do you ever play Skyrim? Love Skyrim. Love Fallout. Fallout is, it goes like Metal mm. Gear Fallout. I just, like, I, so you, I don't listen to music, but I enjoy, thoroughly enjoy 50s and 60s and 40s music, mm. the music from that era because of Fallout. Yeah. It just, I just love Oh, wow. It. Man, that game. I have such sweet I, memories of it. That's wonderful. Yeah. I want to ask you, why don't you listen to music? I I I just I don't find it conducive to studying. Mm. Yeah, that's mm. pretty simple. Yeah. If there's a new Eminem song, I'm gonna check that out. Like you know, <laughs> as soon as I find out though. Gotcha. I listened to Taylor Swift's album the other day. I thought it was great. Her oh, new yeah. album. I never listened to any of her albums before. Her new album, the song called Snow on the Beach. I love that song. Oh, yeah. I got to check it out. Yeah. I like, I mean, I, it's funny. I never, I don't have a single song of hers in my Spotify. Like, because I just, I hear her. <laughs> She's so ubiquitous. I hear her yeah. in the world enough. But I like her. I mean, it's not, no criticism yeah. to her. It's just, uh, see, so yeah, I should go, I should go listen to maybe some more of her catalog because she is, what a force she's become. Oh she's yeah. She's just like taken over. Yeah, and I found that industry. like I would criticize wow. her in my head. This is something I came up with came out with mm. came to the realization of in the past year or so. I just criticize her. Why? Why do I care? It's because I'm I'm jealous of her. I don't even want to mm. be in stadiums. I'm not a musician, but I'm just jealous of her for no reason. It's all criticizing. See. Yeah, why not? Theories of everything and the uh, mega stadium. You know, you could you could pull it off. That'd be cool. One on one conversation. Yeah. Um Got a couple other questions. I know you got to run in a few minutes. I got a few more questions I definitely wanted to just touch on. First is, do you ever find yourself questioning reality and then you snap back to it, remembering that, hey, you have nothing planned for dinner? Yeah, that's hilarious, man. That's that's. <laughs> they should be paying for this one. They should be paying. That's HelloFresh. That's one of the sponsors. Ouch. So Yeah, not a sponsor of this podcast. You were, but... No, no. But you were, you were talking about the success of toe. And then I said, it doesn't feel that successful. And that's because it's for the past year, it's been such a struggle financially, man, like so much of a struggle. Like, so I'm unnerved and frazzled and overtaxed and overburdened and taut and high strung because there was some issue with spo not sponsors, not the sponsors. If you see a sponsor on toe, if you see a toe sponsor and you like them, go check them out. But the people who bring the sponsors, they take a cut. Mm. And then I have mm. people who are bringing me sponsors who got other people bringing them sponsors. And then a third one. So there was like a 30%. Oh my 30%, gosh. 30%, and then I was seeing almost nothing. I still owed thousands of dollars from something which I can't even talk about. And because like I have a contract that I'm not supposed to speak poorly about something. I'm not even allowed to go sure. find my own sponsors. So now, so it's just been. Yeah, but anyway, thanks for bringing up HelloFresh. <laughs> no, I just I've heard that a lot. I'm just like, yeah, I want to, I want mm -hmm. to ask him this uh, this question. I've never, yeah, I haven't gotten into dip my toes in the water as, as sponsorships, but I have had a couple folks reach out to me directly, and I've wondered because yeah, I heard a little bit about this. It sounds not pyramid scheme esque, but mm -hmm. referral, yeah, MLM kind of. How many levels of referrals are there? And can I just go directly to source and, and get yes. perhaps uh, a better deal? So it's something I'm sure I hope one day to not have the same problem, but you know, I hope one day to kind of no, oh, no, get I understand those, what you mean. Yeah. Get, get, get into those and, waters again, a little yeah, bit. Man, Carlos, if you need any connections or tips, you let me know. We'll talk about it off air. It's something that I, oh, thanks. something that I, I guess it's, it's, Something that bothers me is that I've had no help, no help, Carlos, from anyone who's anywhere, anyone who's, I've had no help from any other podcaster. I've had no help from any other guest who like, I'm like, oh, but you know, this person, can you get, can I talk to this person? Some people are like, can't you just ask, I don't want to say names because it's uncouth, but can't you just ask mm -hmm. if you want to speak to say, Bob Lazar, yeah. can't you just mm -hmm. ask so and so? Doesn't work like that. And secondly, every single time that I have, it just doesn't doesn't go through. And I feel so horrible. I feel so alone. Like I'm making this. I'm pushing this boulder. I'm trying so hard over and over and over every single day, over and over and over. 
And so part of me, I think I reached out to you before saying like, Hey, I like your podcast. And if you need some help, like I can retweet something of yours. I think I've reached out to you saying that I apologize if I haven't, but when I make a note of a smaller podcast, I invariably will send them that message. Like, Hey man, I'm a fellow YouTuber. If there's something I can do to help you out, let me know. And, and I'm doing that not because I'm a great person or I'm altruistic, but because I'm so hurt inside. I know what it's like to be a small person where people won't even say your name. They'll quote you, they'll quote a podcast of yours and they won't even say, and that's by the way, it's from theories of everything. I'm like, Oh my gosh, man, you have it so well. And you just, you don't know what it's like. I, I don't live in Texas. I don't have, I don't live near anyone. I don't have these connections. It's not like I can go out to dinner with some people and, and just meet people spontaneously or so I'm so I'm bitter about that and bitter yeah. and hurt about that. Hmm. But anyway, sorry we can talk about like, yeah. Carlos, if you need any help, yeah. If, if there are well, some I, guests of Tolu, if it's that. easy for me to make yeah. an intro, we'll talk. Thank you. I so appreciate that. And actually, I feel similarly in terms of, uh, and this is something that I have to do a better job of, or I, I could at least tr make attempts to be better at. Um, because it does feel like a lonely pursuit for myself as well. I don't have anyone in my social circles that does anything like this. Um, but I also don't, I live in New York City. So um, perhaps, yeah, at this location are, I can imagine there are probably a few more people that are doing something similar or they're nearby um, that I can reach out to. But there's an idea I had actually, I have a few channels that are similar in size to myself and also similar topic that I'm, I'm going to reach out to soon that maybe we could do like a challenge where we have like, I'm about 40,000 subscribers and these channels are as well. It's like first to a hundred thousand subscribers, you know, wins some prize, you know, the, you know, a handful of channels. And so that could kind of get us together in a way where we're, you know, in good nature competing with each other to grow our channels quickly, because mm -hmm. at least for myself, I mean, I think it's interesting. It, 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 the financial pressures that exist for this. You know, I make, I make very little, you know, on this, in this pursuit so far. And it's because of my size and you know, all the other things I could be doing. But um, it's funny because like the drive, the like financial drive, even though I need to make money to live, isn't the, as strong as it sh should be or could be. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I think it's perhaps a, a question of like motivation and, um, and I'm talking in circles here a bit, but it's something that I need to do a better job of because I, I feel the same. I feel similarly in that, uh, yeah, I don't know anybody. You know, I'm, I'm gaining a network sort of every every person I speak with. It's another um, potential avenue, but I don't ask, and I maybe I should uh, ask folks I've had on for warm intros to, you know, people of a, you know, in a more exclusive tier, let's say, to try to get on for guests. Uh, it's something I wrestle with as well. So um, I feel you. If you find success in that, let me know. I haven't. It, I found that <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah, I'll let you know. I mean, it's worth I mean, I haven't even taken the effort or the, the steps to do it. So I'm not even sure. Before we wrap up, I do want to ask you sort of more concrete question. And I know we kind of, we started off very hardcore and uh, very high level and abstract in a lot of ways. So I do want to ask you a question because it's something that I've, I've had it as a personal tenant of mine that um, if we better understand the fundamental nature of reality, that we will better know how we should act in the world. Um, but then David Hume, you're familiar with, I'm sure his is ought problem. You cannot drive yeah. an ought from an is. Where do you stand on that? Do you have an opinion uh, about that frame? Present deliberation is it then depends on what one means by fundamental nature. And it's not clear to me that, look, if when Newton came out with mechanics, that that was a net positive for the world because it made, it, or made us view ourselves as automatons. So it's not clear to me that you just describe more and more fundamental reality with physics, say, or something else, and then you get to a more positive ought. I don't know. I don't know why we don't just start with the ought. Like, forget about it. This is something mm. else. Is, is the whole point of toe to then discard toe? There's a mm. saying that you 
you return home and you know the place for the first time. That's at the end of all the journeying. Is it that you don't answer the questions, but you get comfortable with leaving them unanswered? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know that, that one, Carlos. Yeah, it's a tough one. But I love that response, though. Because that, that, that speaks to me, for sure. The idea of the, the hero's journey, of returning back uh, to where you mm. came from, to where you left off, you, you having changed, and you having brought back something you've learned from your experience in the extraordinary world, that special world. Yeah. It just seems to, it seems to me to be the case that that's the process that we just keep on doing is over and over and over again, going out, seeking, learning, coming back, sharing what we've learned, having a good meal, being with family and friends, and then doing it all over again. <clears throat> it's, it's dangerous though. So the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Frodo, Frodo, Frodo subverts that because he comes back home. But while he's out, this is something that just impacted me so much of the whole story of Lord of the Rings that he gets stabbed with him. I think it's called a Morgul blade. It's a special type of blade and it hurts him and he has to go get healed by the elves. But then at the end of the journey, when he's home, he's there for a couple of years. He always touches here occasionally because it stings. And then he ends up having to even leave home. Because there are some wounds that are so great, they never leave you. Yeah, that's, that, that touches me, man. It's dangerous to go out adventuring. It's not, it's not always guaranteed. It's a net positive. Well, in that case, he did save the world. He just mm. sacrificed himself. Quick question. But whatever I do, I'm I know doing it... with my wife. If I was yes, Frodo and well... I was going away, I would. It would be with my wife, not mm. leaving her. I'll I'll suffer through any pain. I'll suffer through ten of those blades. Anyway, it's wonderful that the love cuts that deep. It's wonderful. I would, I tell my wife all the time, I will love you even if you're a speck. Like if there is nothing mm. left of her except this little dot that I carry around put in my little pocket. You're my my pocket babe then. I'm just gonna carry you. And you can glare at women like you're not having him. You're not having him. Great. Good. Stay there. That's so wonderful. That's so lovely. Thank you, Kurt, for sharing that. Well I'm gonna ask you one last question. The question I ask every guest on the show at the end, if you could go back and give your twenty year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, yeah, it'd be work harder. Oh God, <laughs> just, just work just hard a, enough. An indolent, unindustrious, mm. feckless, rodent, scoundrel. Mm. Work harder. I've, yeah, for me. I know Oprah always says, like, yeah, if I had advice, it'd be relaxed. Yeah, you can say that because you've gotten to the point where you have attained success. You have no idea if you would be at this level. If you didn't feel that drive, you have no idea how people say, oh, my, I'm going to think about what it's like when I'm 90 and do the rocking chair test. How, why is that perspective somehow a privileged perspective? Why do you think that perspective is not going to color? Mm. Anyway. Yeah. No, no, that's great. There's so much wrong. This, again, those are those one of, when this inauthentic copied phrases that people say. It's like the rocking chair test. Like, look how profound I am. I'm going to say the rocking chair test. I mm. say, I don't think people think about what they, I mean, I don't think people think some people, I don't think some people think about what they say. Anyway. Yeah. And one bonus question. Sorry, I'm going to ask you one more. Which toe interview would you consider the most underrated? Oh, that's a great question, man. Great, great, great question. Oh, shoot. I, can you give me? 10 seconds. You can count it down yeah. for me to just browse. It would be one of the more recent ones. Okay. Because I'm just ashamed of anything that's like three months old. Edward Frankel's was fantastic. And yeah, Edward, mm. Edward Frankel's was fantastic. 
an Advaitya, that's a super technical one. But I love philosophy. And then there's Anna Lemke, which is more on the practical side. That one's about mental health and getting over addiction and trauma. It doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the toe. But like I mentioned, toe is a to to at least for me it's a it's a perilous place. And you need these protectors. I want to keep asking you questions, Kurt, but I know you got to go. <laughs> next time, man. We're at time. Yeah, next and time. I'll, this I'll, is so next wonderful. Next time I'm in New York, we can hang out if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see you. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. No, yeah, I'm in, I'm in New York City. So let me know anytime you're swinging by and it'd be great to meet up in person. And thank you again. This is such a wonderful conversation. I know the audience will love it. And, uh, and I want to say I want to extend the same courtesy because because you did a few minutes ago you said if i could reach if you could reach out to me anytime please please do i mean if you, you have anything um i know i'm not a smaller podcast than yours but if i can help out in any way or if you're ever just feeling like you want to reach out to somebody who's doing kind of similar work to you in, in a sense uh i'm there i'll be there for you man thank you thank you <laughs>